Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about extensibility. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I'm 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 coming off of a little bit of an illness, but I'm, I'm getting better. Good, good. Well, thank you for joining me, even though you're uh, not feeling totally optimal. So um, you... Tell me, tell me about your background. You are currently working at with VS Code. Uh, actually, no. Uh, I, I I am with Microsoft, but I'm I'm on the cloud advocacy team. So uh, while we talk with we talk about VS Code a little bit, but we're really more focused on Azure than VS Code. That said, I like to I like to play around with it a lot. You are you are in my head. You are the VS Code person um, <laughs> because I've seen so many streams um, where you were were representing VS Code in in one um, capacity or another. So uh, you're still you're still the VS Code face of VS Code for me. I appreciate it. I, I think the <laughs> the big thing there is it's it's often hard to uh, build a thing, and as you're building it, you know people are going to be asking you questions and, you know, some people will ask you, Oh, what cloud service are you using or how are you deploying it? But I, I have the privilege of, of being able to just like go on teams and message, you know, the people who make VS code. So I'm like, Oh, Hey, what, what are the fun extensions that I should be using? And, and they always hook me up. So normally if I'm on stream, the questions I get are never about like the deployment side. It's always like, Hey, what extension is making, you know, your VS code windows, all different colors. And um, how do you expand your, you know, how do you use presentation mode when you're giving, you know, demos and stuff? So nice. Nice. Um, so what that's, that's an interesting case. It's like, what are the most popular extensions that you see people using on with VS code? I think mostly the, the formatters. So anything that's going to take like, oh, hey, you have, really ugly JSON that you've copy and pasted into a file and like you need it to be a little bit cleaner something. So something like prettier is going to be heavily used. Mm -hmm. um, I also like the styling uh, extension. So uh, anything that's going to add, add a, a pop of color to any type of file format that's hard to look at something like a YAML, something like JSON or XML, like, I think things that help you navigate that quickly are definitely more valuable than, um, you know, one of the extensions that maybe I wrote that has like, <laughs> oh, all of a sudden I've added files to your your directory. Uh, I don't think people are using that as much as more more than like, oh, hey, I made this file look pretty, which there's nothing wrong <laughs> with that. I enjoy I enjoy good aesthetics. So same hard hard same if if i don't like the the way that something looks i'm super distracted by it and like you know sometimes you'll hear some people say like oh you're over optimizing on just the way that it looks or or whatever you should just focus on the the nitty gritty so no. like, i'm never gonna get there they i can, am literally never gonna get to the nitty gritty they can <laughs> they can deal with it because i <laughs> i have a very known thing i so i outside of like this i'm also kind of in the productivity space and i have friends that are like they've written books on like productivity tools and all this other stuff. And they're always like, Oh, have you checked out this thing? And I'm like, I did, but it's ugly though. And it's, it doesn't matter how helpful it is. It's ugly. So I can't, I can't even begin to wrap my head around it because mm -hmm. I, I can't not see, I can't see myself using it if I don't like how it looks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So in, in the, so you were mentioning that prettier is one of the most popular types of, ex uh, of extensions. Are there any uh, sort of categories or like specific extensions or categories of extensions that are surprisingly popular? Like you wouldn't um, expect them to be, but they are? Well, I do have a, luckily we can cheat and find some of the most popular extensions. I'll send send a link your way. Ooh, okay. uh, prettier was, was up there. Uh, so Python, Python and PyLance are, are up there. Uh, a lot of a lot of the language support, so a lot of the language-based servers. Um, recently, we just made it a lot easier for you to build your own custom language support server, uh, mm -hmm. and and that tends to be the thing. So when I see things like Jupyter notebooks, when I see uh, Python and PyLance, these are these are formatter, uh, formatters and linters, things that are going to uh, raise a flag or 
I guess in this case, the red, the red squiggles um, when you've done something that maybe you didn't mean to do. But mm -hmm. I, you know, everything here kind of looks, it, it looks in place. I think what's interesting is we still haven't been able to uh, shake some of the changes that we've done where a lot of these tools have kind of merged into other tools. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at like the Python tool versus PyLance versus, you know, iSort and all these other things, like really you just need one. And instead it's like, ah, no, people are still downloading all the other stuff, which is perfectly fine. You can do, you can do either or. Um, and there's only one theme in this list, which is the GitHub theme, which interesting, interesting. I'm more of a, I'm more of a, like, let's throw some purple and, you know, purple and mm -hmm. lavender and stuff into it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning that the, that people install maybe redundant extensions, extensions that large, largely accomplish the same, same things. Um, in my experience, if uh, the VS code recommends plugins to me, they're like, Hey, yeah. you have done anything relating to Python ever. Here are 17 Python extensions that we recommend that you install. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so now either I take the time to, to like yeah. compare these all side by side to make sure that I've got like the most elegant, smallest solution, or I'm just going to throw everything at it, which is maybe a bit uh, <laughs> Python y, you know? <laughs> and, and there's two different, you know, I guess classifications in that too, because you have extensions and you have bundles and bundles are a group of extensions. So uh, I tend to find bundles when, whenever it's like, Oh, someone, someone has done the hard work for me nice. and said that these are the extensions that I need. I'm just going to install their bundle and then get everything that I need. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that tends to help with that. Um, you know, one of the things that I would, I would say is, you know, we, we have to remember that, the VS Code extension library or, or marketplace is just that it's a marketplace. So there's mm -hmm. nothing preventing someone from saying like, you know, hey, we have five different versions of the same tool. You know, I, I joked about the extension that I made, which is add code of conduct, which does a thing, does it well. It adds a code of conduct to your code. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I created that based off of someone else's extension um, it was outdated. It hadn't been updated in a while. So I said, okay, hey, there are new updates. I was looking at it. I had submitted a couple of issues. I didn't get a response back. And I said, okay, well, I guess I am I am now taking ownership of this project. Mm -hmm. And I, I forked the code because it was MIT licensed and, and nice. was able to put my own version of the extension up with more up-to-date code of conduct licenses and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, it... So when you have that, like, sure, you have a little bit of confusion, but ultimately that's, you want that. You don't want, you don't want VS code saying, oh, well, these tools are okay, but these tools aren't unless they, they pose like a, a genuine security risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that makes sense. And I definitely want to talk more about security um, in a minute, um, but what kinds of problems are people solving using extensions? Um, I mean, it's it's interesting because I, I, I see so many different types of extensions, um, mm -hmm. whether it's adding default files, whether it's reskinning, you know, VS Code with icon packs and themes. Um, I also see, like, you know, we talked about language servers. So it's it's nice to be able to, automatically lint my code every time I save it, like using something like black or iSort or the combination black and iSort, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the biggest thing that we see is, again, just simpler navigation of, of code and explanation of it. That's, that's kind of the big thing is, you know, sure, we look at all the Microsoft base. I'm, I'm looking down here because I still have this, this list open and you know, a lot of the top extensions are Microsoft extensions because they, you know, they support some big language, you know, something like Docker. Um, I don't know about you. I'm not the biggest fan of of having to deal with Docker. I don't know the commands. I I go, oh, 
whatever image is running. Okay, cool, sweet, moving <laughs> on. Um, Pretty much but, same. But when I look at some of the extensions that aren't made by Microsoft, I look at, you know, something, you know, the material icon theme pack, uh, mm. auto rename tag. Again, these are, these are tools that are, you know, one's a stylistic thing. The other is I want to quickly change an HTML tag and not have to go find the other one. I just know that if I change one, it changes the other for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, I, I think it's these little things that they could be baked into the system, but ultimately I, I think it's better if they're not because, you know, the last thing you want is another setting that you have to think about changing every time you go into a project. Okay, so that's really interesting because my next question was going to be like, how how does Microsoft make a decision between what should be an extension versus what should be a built-in feature? And you're saying that like from the user experience perspective, that it's better to to not have these toggles that you have to change every time. Uh, I th I think it's two things, and again, I'm not I'm not on the VS Code team. I mm -hmm. I just message them a lot. Um, from what I can I can tell, and, and I actually just I gave a talk about this for a Python package that I maintain. There's everything that's built into the code is hold on one second, I'm gonna close my door. My daughter's probably about to get her hair brushed. No awesome. worries. <laughs> Thank you. So the like when you're a package maintainer, anytime you make a change, you have to think about all of the things that it will affect downstream. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the hardest part. So if, if you make everything built in to VS Code, if you make all the language servers built in, if you make the themes and you make you know all these other tools built into the core software, when it comes time to produce an update, you now have to think about how that's going to affect all of those things that you've built in. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that you don't think about how it's going to affect e extensions, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to say, hey, we are changing how this works or we are adding this feature and your extension has the ability to support it, but we're not going to wait specifically for every single extension or every single maintainer of an extension to be like, yes, let's go and update all of these together and then make one big, big swoop. Whereas if you, if you were to have all of those things built into VS code and all of a sudden you're like, well, Hey, this feature in VS code doesn't work anymore. That becomes a big issue. Uh, whereas, you know, kind of the same thing happens with an extension someone goes, oh, well, this extension may not work anymore. So then you reach out to the extension maintainer and you say, well, okay, can you fix it? Or someone goes in and creates a new extension and, and mm -hmm. updates it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it. It allows us to be a little bit more nimble. And I, I think that that's, that's kind of the, the biggest advantage of that. And, and then also you gotta, you have to think about layers of support. You know, one of these, uh, these big packages was JavaScript ES6. Well, you know, if we did something similar with Python and you're like, okay, well, we want to have a Python linter that is, it supports Python 3.7 through 3.11. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means now when July comes around and 3.7 is deprecated, you now have a complete VS Code update that has to account for like, all right, now we're taking out all the three seven support. We're making sure three eleven is good. We're getting ready for three twelve because that'll be available in October. And it's like you're you're modifying the the main editor for these things that happen. And again, that's just for the Python cycle, which is annual. You know, mm -hmm. Node fourteen is being deprecated soon, so you see deprecation warnings popping up all over the place. Uh, so it's, it's just better to say we're going to provide a really good code editor 
Mm -hmm. and then let the people who are passionate about maintaining extensions, and some of those are teams at Microsoft, mm -hmm. but we're going to let them focus on understanding when's the right time to provide updates for these extensions, how is it going to best perform given the, the base code editor, mm -hmm. and you know, kind of move it from there. Right, right. Okay, so yeah, so an advantage of, of the extension model is that you don't have to maintain the or rather vs code does not have to maintain um maintaining extensions them yeah. it, itself um which which lets vs code um have have more more freedom and more almost autonomy um yeah. in a sense there's yeah. also the performance side of it too i mean i don't know if anyone has noticed but when you have i think at this moment i, I probably have like 200 extensions installed wow. because i do a lot of testing of things but, you know, those start to take performance hits. When you mm -hmm. install that fresh version of VS Code for the first time, everything is snappy and it's, it's moving quickly. And, you know, I also apparently enjoy torture. So I, I use Vim mode. Um, and it's like the thing I can tell when I have too many extensions installed is when Vim mode can't keep up with keystrokes. So like I'll start like entering keystrokes and then all of a sudden nothing's happening and then it tries to catch up and it like makes a bunch of moves after the fact. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, if VS Code had to support that out of the box, the initial feeling of Visual Studio Code would be slow. It'd be it'd be very very like laggy in many cases if it had mm -hmm. to account for every single possible extension as it's being brought in. But it gives people the ability to say, hey, I can install what I need. I'm oh, sorry, I can install what I need. Or I can be extremely lightweight. Maybe you have, you're using something like VS Code Profiles. And you know, I have a couple of machines. One of them isn't as performant as the other. So on that profile, I'm running a little bit lighter. Whereas you know, on my Mac Studio, I have a little bit more resource. So I can install more of the extensions that I want to use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's that code maintenance piece and also the performance piece. Yes, yeah. that's, that's pretty pretty handy. Um, so I did want to circle back to the security idea. So, mm -hmm. what does Microsoft do around um, sec extension security? So, uh, I, I say this in terms of security. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we we do the thing where we we scan extensions for viruses. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is usually the extension lives within GitHub. Um, so those same runners that scan packages and repositories for any type of malware or malicious content, like those things make their way through VS Code as well. So stuff like everything gets scanned as it's going through and it's it's periodically checked as well. So it's not like we just scan it the one time. It's it's being continuously scanned. Um, however, what we're, you know, what you have to figure out from there is malicious versus, you know, malware. Uh, there are, there could be bad practices that are included into a project. Um, I've actually seen some that are very much like, you know, you, you test it out. It's a great service, but it spams you and asks you to donate like every, you know, every time you open up the window and it's like, mm -hmm. but it, they're going to send you to some link outside of VS Code. And then you have to, you know, determine for yourself whether or not it's worth taking that risk. Mm -hmm. um, so like, even when, even when the code itself isn't malicious, there, there may be something there that, that can be dangerous. And that's where we have, a lot of those really big reporting tools. So we make it really easy for people that like, oh, hey, this seems to be predatory in nature. We're going to, I want to report it. And we take those reports very seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have you have security, you have the like sort of, you front load some security where, mm -hmm. where you're scanning the extensions and then also the users can report, report problems. So you sort of have it bookended uh, yeah. with security practices. That exactly. makes sense. And, and again, it's, it's one of those things of like, you know, whether you want to report abuse or you just want to report bad practice, you know, that, you know, we, we take all of those seriously and we, we go and review them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any interesting edge cases? Not that I could think of. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, again, like I said, I'll, I'll, 
I don't know of many extensions that have paywalls. Um, material is one of those that I know mm -hmm. does, uh, yeah. only because I've tried it. And it's mm -hmm. like, all of a sudden it was like, oh, hey, we've deactivated your theme until you give us money. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. well, time to go find another theme. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I again, I, I don't. I'm, I don't think that we're in the business of telling people how to how to build their their extensions. Um, I think if we were to do that, I mean, I think the the big rule is like as long as it's safe and as long as it it fits within the model of extensibility that VS Code handles. Um, I I don't think we want you know, hey, you know, take this extension and this extension basically reskins another application to to you know or sends you out of VS code. Um, those get kind of weird. Um, again, it, as someone who doesn't work on that team that makes those decisions mm -hmm. every once in a while, I'll see a theme that's like, Oh, it automatically opens this thing up for you. And you're like, I don't know if it should. I don't know if I, I don't know if I enjoy that idea, but it's, it's kind of hard to, it's hard to be non partial, I guess in that sense. So you, you don't want to say, well, you're, you know, you you have some extension that all it does is take people's code and puts it in some other application. Um, you'd think that we would probably be against that, but honestly, I, I think that we, we do play the, the impartial judge there and say like, yeah, I mean, are we happy about it? Not really, but is it violating any rules? I don't think so. Are there rules like written down? Um, there's more of, let me see. I think we have more exten extension capabilities. So like, as long as you're using the API, like if mm -hmm. the API allows you to do a thing, then. Okay. Right. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's something that I'd love to talk more about, um, in more, in greater depth. Um, so the API lets you lets you do sort of a certain set of things, interact with with certain parts of VS Code and other parts not. How does Microsoft make decisions about what the API will will expose and what it won't? Um, you know, I I honestly don't fully know. Okay. Uh, that might be a question for someone on the VS Code team. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to if I were to you know put up a guess, you know, first things first, you, you want to make sure that the extension itself isn't going to cause VS Code to crash. So anything that could be potentially like damaging to the executable would be a problem. But mm -hmm. other than that, I mean, I think we've, we've mentioned before, this is a, an electron based app. So a lot of the things that you get are designed to be like modular and uh, almost like you would style a web page. So is if the API exposes it, yeah, I mean, if you want to modify tree view, if you want to modify web view, like you can do a lot of different things. Um, for a while, I had my Twitch like chat stream, like being thrown into VS Code just so that I didn't <laughs> have to you, that way you don't have to like look at different screens. You could be writing yeah. code and have your like Twitch chat next to you. And oh nice. That's just it's just taking advantage of, of some of the the different view manipulation tools that are available. So I, I think that you know as as long as you're as long as you're not doing something that's going to cause the internal system to to break down, I I, I think it's it's pretty fair game in what you're able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, neat. And so, so comparing um, VS Code to uh, say like Atom uh, as a text editor, I think it was just recently sunsetted. Yeah. Like this, well, I was going to say this year, but I guess it would have been last year now. Yeah. Um, and Atom let you kind of do anything that you wanted. You had all kinds of latitude to like uh, anything um, to, to, um, I'm trying to think of of a uh, an idiom that isn't horrible because there's the one that's like, uh, 
make enough rope to hang yourself with or something, which is, which yeah. is appalling. So what, you know, make enough, I don't know, something. Anyway, make your own mess. Make your own bed and lie in it, I guess, sort of <laughs> kind of situation. Um, and um, VS Code does not allow um, users to make too much of a mess, it seems like. Is that yeah. a fair assessment? I, I think that's the biggest difference is, is Adam kind of came out of the gate as this, like, you, you can do anything, uh, even if that means breaking the application. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, VS Code, I, I feel in, in the spirit is it is the, the refined version of that, of like, you can do almost everything and you know, the only thing that we're, we're really protecting is performance of, of, of the actual, you know, application. And again, it's, it's, it's one of those things where like, if you want to install 200 extensions like me, then go ahead, but just know that it's going to be a little bit slower if you don't have the resources for it. And, mm -hmm. um, and kind of make everything work together in kind of a more fluid space. Whereas with Adam and, you know, I was an Adam user. Wow. I'm trying to think of when I, when I last used Adam, it was probably, I went from Adam to Vim to VS code to VS code Vim mode. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it was probably maybe five or six years ago, but when with Adam, there were often times where like I would want to start extending so many things and then like the extensions would compete with each other uh, and cause problems where mm -hmm. it seems like with VS Code, you don't necessarily get that. You don't have that problem. Yeah. So that must be an interesting um, optimization um, to be to be making happen behind the scenes. Um, I'd be really curious to know how how the, the VS Code devs how can you, I guess it would be because you can, you can only do things that the API lets you do. Somehow the API um, is designed so well that it can tell whether two extensions would be contradicting each other, I suppose. I, I don't think that they necessarily like check for any form of contradiction. I think that there's just kind of a, a better order of operations happening there of, so oh. you might have something that's overriding the the things that the other application did, uh, which I've definitely had that problem before where I've had like, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was like prettier and then another formatter. And basically it always took one of like, if you ran prettier, it would do a thing and then you save it and then it undid the thing that prettier just did because of another extension in the way. Um, and, and again, those, those are the things that keep, you know, VS code from having all of that stuff baked in because then now mm -hmm. you're like, Oh, I got to test for that versus it's saying like, Oh, perhaps you shouldn't run these two extensions together. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you do, we're going to, like you said, order of operations, we're going to apply the changes from this one first, and then we'll apply the changes from the other one. And if that's not yep. turning out the way that you want it to, you can sort that out by <laughs> yeah. turning one of them off or or the other. That makes sense. So it really lets your users um, control their experience really nicely without being a huge um, like operational burden to the VS Code team. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's something that's so neat about extensibility. Um, where you know you get those um you get that customization piece for the user experience without having the devs have to maintain it. And you get that security piece because this this code is running on the extension code is running on the user's machines and not in VS Code's infrastructure. Yeah. And you get um the, the performance, you, well, I was going to say performance enhancement, but it's more like non-performance throttling. Degradation, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that, that makes it really nice too because I've, I've definitely had those moments where it's like, oh, I've, I've gone and done it again and installed like five extensions that I shouldn't have installed together. 
Mm-hmm. And the easiest solution for that is like, okay, boot this up in like clean mode where like it doesn't have any of the extensions installed and just make sure that like the, the service itself is fine, uh, which usually it is. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and, and then go back and be like, all right, how do we go? And, and also I, I love that part of the extensibility of it is just because you've installed every extension, you know, under the planet, you can then use something like a dev container or uh, code spaces and only install the extensions that you need for that project, uh, which is the thing that I've really, I mean, that's why I get away with installing so many extensions is, is that it's like, all right, if I'm working on, you know, an Azure based project, I can only, I can like basically set it up in a dev container that only installs the Azure based stuff and then all the Python stuff that I need. And I don't need all of these other extensions running at the same time. So I can disable those. Okay. So that makes a ton of sense because I was actually very slightly confused. And I was like, I'll figure this out later. What, what this means when you said you can use, choose which extensions you're using based on which project you're using. Cause that seemed like a big task to me to like go through a list of 200 extensions or whatever um, and like manually toggle them on or off. But you're saying that you don't, you actually can just make a, just with containers um, or with code spaces. Um, You can just, just pick the handful that you need for, for whatever project. Yep. And then, and you can also do this on a per project level of like, Oh, I have um, there's in that settings.vs code, you can actually say these are the, extensions installed um, and installed are more like enabled, disabled. So like, oh, hey, only only enable these extensions for this project. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like the idea of doing that more in dev containers. Um, and I'm actually giving a talk about this uh, next month at uh, Southern California Linux Expo in oh. that the like dev containers and code spaces are such a game changer for maintainers. Because what, what we've done before is we've, we've basically said like, oh, hey, if you containerize your deployment, everyone has the same system. But now mm-hmm. when you do something like dev containers or code spaces, you have the same editor and the same deployment environment. So now you're operating inside of a container, but you're also operating inside a container with all the tools that you need to develop this in this space. And, and that can even include things like, you know, we're Python developers. So, Hey, you want to install PyTest or PyTest coverage, or you want to enforce some level of linting involved in your project. So mm-hmm. your dev container includes things like black or ice sort or pre-commit. And mm-hmm. now it's someone making their first open source contribution to your project doesn't have to think about all of those things. All they have to do is open up code spaces, make their change, and then when they go to commit it, pre-commit's going to do black, it's going to, you know, it's going to run iSort, it's going to, you know, you can even pre-test and then do all of these things. And that makes the accessibility to newer contributors um, you know, greater. And and that's that's the thing that I've I've really try to do now just as I've gotten a little bit older and uh, a little bit more eager to have other people working with my code uh, because I can't type as you know well as I used to and you know I have as I'm getting older and stuff and so now it's like how do I how do I make it so that I can still ensure that someone new is coming into my code and treating it the way that I would treat it. Well, I give them my environment. I give them my, you know, the things that I'm running to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And I can, I can do that via code spaces or via dev containers. And they're not that hard to set up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are code spaces similar to, um, or different from the new, uh, so what is it? VS code.dev or code.dev? Um, Running it oh, in the browser, can you run the, the code spaces in the browser too? Or yes, so the code spaces have to be ran in the browser. Oh. Um, the so a dev container itself can run locally, mm-hmm. but if you have a dev container inside of your repo when you go to GitHub, it will allow you to open it up in code spaces. So you you know if I say that 
to develop on this, you need all of these resources, but you know, you're working off of a Raspberry Pi, maybe you don't have those resources available to you, then you can load it into Code Spaces. And now uh, Code Spaces is free for everyone for a certain number of hours. I don't remember the actual number of hours per month, but that makes it extremely accessible. So instead of mm -hmm. it being like, oh, you know, my business has to do this or I have to pay for it. It's like if someone just wants to make a quick change or if they're wanting to develop on this tool and they don't have the resources to run it, then they just open up code spaces and it creates a container for them and it's not on their machine and it allows them to develop it. But it's the same settings. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I have a, a computer here that I, I invested a lot of resources into. So I can have, you know, 300 gigs worth of Docker containers in there and, you know, all that stuff, which 300 gigs of Docker containers is like three containers. So it's not that, not that bad. That's, that's just Docker being Docker, I guess. Um, I don't know. You're going to, you're going to hear me. I'm not going to throw shade on Docker all day. I might, but I'll try not to. <laughs> um, so what, what kinds of considerations have to go into porting something like VS Code so that it can run in the browser? I think the biggest one is it needs to, the experience needs to be as similar to the desktop environment that you're used to. Mm -hmm. um, I know that that's, that's always a challenge and, and some things you're just not going to be able to do. But like when you mm -hmm. think about and nobody wants that watered down version of, of some other tool like mm -hmm. that. I, I've, I've been there before of like, oh, you could either download it and use it offline or you could go use the web tool. But if you use the web tool, you're not going to get all these features. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's to say that like some things just cannot be ported over. Um, you know, we we talked about kind of the web assembly of it all that unfortunately not everything is accessible through web assembly yet. But mm -hmm. more and more things are becoming accessible. Yep. Um, so it's it, it's kind of that idea of like, as things become more available, mm -hmm. then we can work to make that parity one-to-one. -one. But in, until then, it's like, you know, our goal is to make the base experience as, as equivalent, whether you mm -hmm. are in a browser or on your desktop. Mm -hmm. um, and work to again you have to kind of if your extensions don't allow you to to do that then unfortunately there's nothing we can do about that but at least the core experience can be the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i guess that's that's another advantage of the of vs code's extension model that if because if you were building all of those things into web uh, <laughs> vs code you'd it would be a lot harder to get that to run in a performant way in yeah. the browser, that would and be. You'd have to take all of those things into consideration yeah. of like, oh, hey, we don't have, you know, we're running Pyodide at its earliest stage. Okay, what does that mean? What bugs have not been found? Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the edge cases that you have to take into account. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's the, when it comes to, I guess, working on a code editor, you know, I build, I build Python packages. It's like one of my, my favorite things to do is to like, oh, I want to build a thing that does this. Okay, cool. Throw it on PyPI. I don't have to take every single use case into account. I, I basically think about what I want to do and then I write the code that does it. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you're building a code editor, you have to take into account everybody that is going to potentially, potentially use your code editor. So for me, it's like, oh, I wrote this thing for Python developers. Okay, what about Ruby developers? What about JavaScript developers? What about, you know, testers and, and people who, like, I I see and hear about so many people that use VS Code for things other than VS Code. Like, I use it for note-taking and things like that. And mm -hmm. it's, when you have to think about all of those people, sometimes it's better to just say, you know what? basic text editor here you go it works everywhere and then mm -hmm. if you have a specific use case then download the extension that you need and hopefully that extension will also take into account all of the needs of the people who are going to use that extension including using it in the web mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Are there different security considerations for running extensions in the browser than there are for running the extensions natively? I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I, I would assume that the level of security is the same in terms of like, you know, scanning everything and, and, and having that level of security. Uh, one of the things that we do is kind of a trust model. So if you've ever tried to open a file outside of the project that you're working on in VS Code, you get this like, hey, you're about to open something that's not a part of this project. Do you trust it? Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. um, and even in... I don't think we have any extensions that work in the web that don't work locally. So I think because of that, you don't necessarily have, you know, I, I, I'm in my mind, my, my brain goes immediately to like, okay, someone downloads this extension in the web and it like sets up a crypto miner or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think we're there yet, but again, I, I think that that's where scanning and active reporting is is really useful and and again when if you've ever reported something in vs code like that that does get taken seriously it does get looked at obviously the mm -hmm. more information you can give us the better um so I, I would just say like if if you see something that you're like oh that's weird i don't think that's supposed to be doing that like report it because we have we have plenty of resources that can go to checking and making sure that these things are doing what they say they're doing and nothing else mm -hmm. So there are there are extensions that can run natively that can't run in the browser, but at the moment there it doesn't go the other way. There aren't extensions that run in the browser that don't that or that yeah that don't do run in the browser and don't run natively. To my knowledge, that's correctly. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So those are all of the questions that I have prepared. Are there any other um, questions that I should have asked about extensibility at VS Code? Um, no, I, I think more than anything, I, I just, I always want to tell people that like building an extension is easier than you think. Um, mm. I, the extension that I built was out of frustration, which is how I develop most of the things that I develop. Mm -hmm. But being able to just walk through the guide made it relatively easy. Um, I've thought about different extensions that I want to build. And, you know, sadly, I just don't have, there's not enough time in the day to do all the things that I want to do. But mm -hmm. I, I definitely would encourage people that if, if you see or if you have an idea for an extension, like tell people about it build a basic, you know, proof of concept. Um, and the API does make it relatively easy. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you have any knowledge of TypeScript, that makes it easier. Um, mm. Going into my first extension, I had never used TypeScript. So, uh, and I was able to build something within like a couple of days. So it, okay. it isn't as hard as it seems. Um, uh -huh. Easy to start, maybe hard to, you know, build and develop and iterate on and, you know, make this super amazing extension. But if you just have a simple need and you need to like get a proof of concept up or, or solve your specific need and only your specific need, you can totally uh -huh. do that. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And so that's, um, you write in <laughs> TypeScript, um, in order to create an extension, no matter what language that extension might be targeting. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been so much fun. And um, it's been really interesting hearing about the how, how the extension model works at VS Code um, and sort of comparing it in my mind to extension models um, for, for other situations like Zapier and, and um, if this, then that, and, and that's in what we do at Suborbital. Um, so, yeah, because there are so much, there are far more similarities there than than differences. Yeah, I I would also encourage people if you if you want to get the most out of VS Code, check us out on YouTube. Um, the VS Code channel is really fun. I think I actually have a video on there too. Um, but especially if you're doing Python things, I'm trying to find the link for it now. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. But yeah, we are. 
there are a lot of, of really fun things that you can do with VS Code that I don't think we spend enough time on. Also, a uh, shameless plug for my YouTube channel where I talk about all things uh, productivity tools, programming, and occasionally I do some YouTube shorts with, with some VS Code stuff in there as well. I am just grabbing a link to your channel. So I can drop that in the comments. Y'all should definitely check out Jay's channel. Um, and Jay, you are also on, on Twitch. Yep. And where else can people find you? <coughs> That's mostly it. Um, I tell people, don't look for me. I'm around. You'll find me. You don't have to look. Uh, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Twitch. Uh, uh -huh. I do a couple of podcasts. Uh, one of them is called Conduit, where we we look at productivity from a very realistic approach, uh, whether it's life, business, or the messiness in between. Uh, we're not going to give you... Well, we're going to give you weird techniques and, and tools and tricks, but we've all made them up right on the spot. Um, just which I'll give you a secret. Most of the productivity experts do the same thing. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> that's called conduit. Um, and yeah, just have fun, write code. That's it for me. Nice. I'm going to just drop a link to conduit as well. As you know, I am a big fan. Oh, okay. Well, it's a very long link because it's a referral link from YouTube because oh. that's where I grabbed the, the link from. Um, For conduit? Mm -hmm. On YouTube? Yeah. I had the tab open, so oh, I just, you know, okay, okay, okay. snagged it. <laughs> um. All right, and oh, I see, we've got a link for the VS Code um, YouTube channel as well. All right, so we have people all covered. And Naya, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. And thank you again to Jay for joining me. Absolutely, anytime. All right, thanks, bye-bye.